Dr. Louis Perfetta. Um, Dr. Perfetta is an emergency physician at St. Vincent's Hospital in Indianapolis, a clinical professor of emergency medicine for um, IUSM as well as Marion University School of Medicine. He's a graduate of Indiana University and did his very first HMP here in Bloomington Hospital. Um, he completed his postgraduate training in emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Perfetta is a dynamic and sought after public speaker and writer, a frequent guest on TV and radio shows. He has gained critical acclaim for his essays and writing on various topics, such as his eye opening love at our national preparedness for the influenza pandemic in What Scares Me More Than Ebola. In 2015, he was named top voice in LinkedIn for readership and healthcare. His scathingly sarcastic but passionate essay, Your Kid and My Kid Aren't Playing in the Pros, was honored as one of the best articles on sports in 2014 by the Society of Professional Journalism. His best-selling book, The Patient in Room 9 Says He's God, continues to earn critical acclaim as a poignant and passionate look on society, God, and life through the eyes of an emergency medicine physician. His most recent essay, I Know You Love Me, Now Let Me Die, has been read more than 3 million times on LinkedIn and Huffington Post and has sparked a whole new debate on end-of-life care. He has pretty quickly become one of the most widely read and celebrated writers in the history of LinkedIn. Please help us welcome Dr. Lewis M. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'm not sure I'm as dynamic as you would uh, let out to be, but uh, hopefully we can keep you entertained. Every medical student in the back, I'm also head of medical education, so I'll remember you. And make sure you do nothing but night shifts. I'm supposed to tell a story real quick about, is Dr. Martin here? You guys know Martin? So in his infinite wisdom, Dr. Martin decided he was going to teach us about the reabsorption of sugars during our uh, uh, physiology time here. So he told us not to eat, that he was going to give us lunch. It's a different lunch than what you have. So he broke half of us up into a glucose solution and the other half into fructose. Did you guys do that? All of us had to crap the entire day. <laughs> it was in the, the fructose. Uh. <clears throat> so in the olden days, she would be propped up on a comfy pillow in fresh clean sheets under the corner window where she would, in days gone past, watch her children play. Soup would boil on the stove in case she felt like a sip or two. Perhaps the radio softly played Al Jolson with Glenn Miller. Flowers sat on the nightstand and family quietly came and went. These were her last days, spent with familiar sounds of a familiar room with familiar smells that gave her a final chance to summon memories that would carry her away. She might have offered a hit of a smile or a soft squeeze of a hand, but it was all right if she didn't. She lost her own words to tell us that it's okay to let her die, but she trusted us to be her voice, and we took that trust to heart. You see, that's how she used to die. We could still look at her face then, we could deep into her eyes and see the shadows of a soft, clean, vibrantly innocent child playing on a porch somewhere in the Midwest, perhaps. A small rag doll dances and plays and she clutches it in her hand and she laughs with her barefoot brother who's clad in overalls. As he chases her around the yard, he's got a grasshopper on his finger and she screams and giggles and her father watches from the porch in a wooden rocker and he laughs and mom kisses scolds her brother. We could see her taking a ride in an automobile for the first time. Pickup truck made with wooden panels and driven by a young man with wavy curls. He smiles gently at her, and she stares at the road ahead, a leading wisp of a smile gives her away, and her hands are folded in her lap, and she's clutching maybe a small beaded purse. And we could see her standing in a small church. She's dressed in white cotton, holding hands with that same young man and saying, I do. Her mom watches with tearful eyes. Her dad has since passed. Her new husband lifts her across the threshold, holding her tight and promises to love and care for her forever, and she is enriched and she is happy. And we could see her cradling an infant, cooking breakfast, hanging sheets, loving her family, sending her husband off to war in her child's school. And we could see her welcoming him 
back from battle with a hug that lasts the rest of his life. She buries him on a Saturday under an elm, next to her father. She marries off her child and she spends her later years volunteering at church functions before her mind starts to fade and the years take their toll. And God says, it's time to come home. This is how he used to see her before we became blinded by the endless tones of monitors and words of machine, buzzards, buttons, and tubes that can add five years to a shell of a body that was entrusted to us and should have been allowed to pass quietly, propped in a corner room, under a window, sense of homemade soup in case you wanted to sip. You see, now we can breathe for her. We can eat for her. We can even pee for her. Once you have those three things covered, you can instead She can instead be gently cradled under the corner window. She can be placed in a nursing home, and she can be penned in a cage of bed rails in soft restraints meant to keep her safe. She can be fed a steady diet of insure through a tube directly into her stomach, and she can be kept alive until her limbs contract her skin thins so much that a single bump on that bed rail can literally open her up, exposing the tendons to wide-eyed medical students looking for a chance to sew, perhaps. She can be kept alive until her bladder becomes chronically infected, until antibiotic-resistant diarrhea flows and pulls in her diaper so much that it erodes her buttocks. The fat padding around her tailbone and hips are consumed, and ulcers open up, exposing underlying bone, which becomes ripe for infection. We're now in this time of medicine where we can take that small child running through the yard, being chased by her brother with a grasshopper on his finger, and we can imprison her in a shell of a body that does not come close to radiating the life that she once had. We stopped seeing her, not intentionally perhaps, but we stopped. Now this isn't meant as a condemnation of these families, but it is meant as an indictment of a system that now herds these families down dead-end roads and prods them into believing that this is the new norm and somehow the old ways were the wrong ways, and this is how we show love. Now, a day doesn't go where by when my, myself and my partners are going to look at each other and say, how do we stop this madness? How do we get people to allow themselves and their families to die? And I've been practicing emergency medicine for almost a quarter of a century now. I've seen thousands of elderly patients, and I, like my colleagues, have come to realize but while we're developing more ways to extend life, we've also provided water and nutrients to a forest of unrealistic expectations that have real-time consequences to those failed body, frail bodies that have been entrusted to us. Now, this transition to doing more did not just happen on a specific day in some month of some year. Our end-of-life psyche has slowly evolved and shifted in a few generations have passed since the onslaught of the Industrial Revolution of Medicine. Now we're trapped. We've accumulated so many options, drugs, stents, tubes, <coughs> snake oils, that we cannot throw a blanket over all our elderly and come to a consensus as what constitutes inappropriate and excessive care. We can't separate out those things meant to prolong life from those things meant to improve quality of life. So nearly 50% of the U.S. population now dies in nursing homes or hospitals. When they do, they're often surrounded by teams of us doctors, nurses, medical students. And we're pounding on their chest and we're breaking their ribs and we're burrowing large eye IVs with burned out veins and plunging tubes and swollen bleeding airways. And we never say much as we frantically try to save these lives. We know we can't save, or perhaps silently hope we don't save. When, it finally, when it's finally over, and the last heartbeat blips across the screen and we survey the clutter of bloody gloves, wrappers, masks, and needles that now litter the room. You may catch a glimpse of the bow our heads in shame, fearful perhaps, that someday we may have to stand in front of God as he looks down and says, what the hell were you thinking? When it comes time for us to be called home, those of us, and you soon, in the know, will pray that when we gaze upon our last breath, that we will be grateful that our own doctors and our families chose to do what they should instead of what they could. And with that, we will close our eyes to the familiar sounds in a familiar room, a fleeting smile, and a soft squeeze of a gentle hand.
So that was the last last that it was in LinkedIn. So how do you define compassion? Well, it literally means to suffer together. And I suppose that running a code or cardiac arrest on that lady that we were talking about in her you know, waning years of life, I suppose that could count as compassion. And I've heard, but, but what happens if me as a doctor only feels that way 10% or 50% of the time? Sounds sort of strange to say, doesn't it? And you can feel real bad about running a code on somebody at one point, the only patient at one point, and it really touch you viscerally, it really bother you. And then maybe 10% or 50% of the time you're ambivalent about it. Does that mean that you're lacking in compassion? I don't know. It's been said among emotional researchers that compassion is that feeling arrive that arises when you're confronted with somebody else's suffering and you feel the need to go and respond and help out. Sounds simplistic, it makes sense, right? We're out shopping and we see an elderly lady maybe laboring to put groceries in the car and we run over and we help her. We see somebody slip on the ice and bothers us and we run over and give them a hand. Makes sense. Empathy, when we use the word empathy, it's more of this feeling that you've been there, that you commiserate, that you have an idea, that you experience the thing, same thing. We're empathetic at times. Sympathy, though, is maybe a little deeper. We see something, maybe on the TV. Um, look, who's that, Cheryl Crow that sings with dogs that are all in the, the kennels, and uh, you know, we get all weepy and it really bothers us, so we send you know, $50 to the Humane Society or what have you, or feed the children or any of those things that really bother you. You're really sympathetic about that cause. So we went into medicine because we have compassion. We're going to suffer together. We have sympathy. We really feel these problems. We're empathetic. We want to help. We've been there. That's why we became doctors, right? Right? That's why you're all in medical school. It's not why I went to medical school. I went to medical school for the money. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I went to medical school for the money. Now, before you look at me with some uber leftist disdain, give me a, <laughs> give me a, a sec, all right? We didn't have a whole lot growing up. I mean, and we had a small house in a not real welcoming area of the town. Um, most of my clothes were bargain basement or Goodwill or Sears Roebuck. Um, I didn't have, you know, back in the 70s, early 80s, I didn't have for the, the neat clothes, I don't have them now, but um, you know, but I didn't have the Izods or the Polos or the Topsiders or the Penny Loafers that everybody was wearing back then. In fact, my mom once cut the Izod logo off a pair of used socks that she got and she sewed it on like a Sears shirt to make it look like I had a designer shirt. I don't know if any of you did that. I'm Scott. I never came back from Christmas break or spring break in one of those neon shirts that highlighted your tan like everybody else did. I worked from the time I was 11 on, I did everything, from cleaning gutters, I sold golf balls that I collected on nearby golf courses. I stole my dad's beer and sold it to the golfers outside. I did everything. <laughs> okay, painted mailbox, babysat, worked as a telemarketer, you name it, I did it just to make a buck. And it sounds shallow, but when you don't have that stuff, you haven't experienced that stuff, it's important to you. It's important to a seventh grader. And some of you probably know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't, but that's okay. But it was, it was important at the time. And that whole notion about my friends whose folks were doctors, and sort of cool, call them doctors that are Mrs. and Mrs. And um, they had swimming pools, and a little nicer house, and nicer clothes, and I wanted that. So I was going to go to medicine. That wasn't all. Of I was also, and people from my generation, was also enthralled with MASH. The show MASH. And I'll tell you, MASH drove more people my age into medical school than damn near any show on TV. Also, uh, Emergency with Gage and DeSoto and those shows. And Hawkeye Pierce and BJ Honeycutt sort of embodied what I wanted to become in a, as a doctor. I was going to become a doctor because, you know, you watch MASH, you can see how they are, and that's what medicine's about. So I was going to shadow some doctors. I did a couple shadowing shifts. I even got my EMT license here. And I knew what it was going to be like to be a doctor. So I went pre-med. Made sense. Easy way to go from working class family 
to middle class, upper class. Now, trust me when I say that my priorities have changed. I'm a different person than I was when I was that pre-med student. And trust me when I say also that I could have made a lot more money doing something else under this job. You'll see, it's gonna get worse. <laughs> um, so you think I had any idea when I was your age, when I was a pre-med student or a medical student, about what it really meant to be a doctor or what compassion was in medicine or empathy was in medicine? I mean, do you honestly think that as second, first, second, third year medical students, you can really commiserate or connect with a 50-year-old mother with metastatic breast cancer who's fairly certain she's going to leave two children in the near future? You think I had any idea when I was a pre-med student what it was like to deal with a dying AIDS patient? And if you were in medical school like I was in the late 80s, residents in the early 90s, that is all we had on our internal medicine service. It was horrible. Young men, 20 years old, all dying. Horrible, painful deaths. Most of them feeling disenfranchised in the community. And that is what one minute you're partying at the frat house, next minute you're taking care of this population. You have to think I had any idea what that was going to be like when I signed up for this whole pre-med thing. You have to think I had any idea what it was going to be like when I, as a parent, had to find out my own child had cancer. Had no idea. But you sort of think you do because you're pre-med, you're in medical school. Now, certainly you might have been able to empathize with something, or you still can right now, or you're able to empathize with certain disease states. Maybe you had a kidney stone, okay, and your first patient is somebody else passing the kidney stone, you go, pow, I know how it feels, like trying to piss out a bone-in ribeye. Trust me, I've been there, I know. So yeah, that might make your patient feel good. You've been there, you understand their pain. But what about the idea that maybe tragically you had a loved one killed, a spouse killed in a car accident. And you're now faced with the task of having a patient that's also been killed. And what you have to do next is one of the most horrible things you can imagine. You've got to go in there and tell their husband or wife that this person's died. And maybe you've gone through the exact same thing. So you remember those horrible words that you once heard, I'm sorry. He's died. I'm sorry, she's died. And you tremble as you walk into the quiet room, knowing that you're going to break this news. But you also feel, hey, there's a connection here. I understand. There's a bond. Because I've been through this. So you tell this woman that her husband has been killed in a car accident. And like I said, you think that there's connection. How incredibly naive we are when it comes to something like that. Do you honestly think that anything in your life that you've been through somehow will make this better for that person? The only thing that you have in common is that you both have been through the same thing, but you have no idea what that death of that person means to that family because it's not about you. We don't know what their relationship is. Do they have children? Was he a good husband? Was he a bad husband? Are they now going to face financial ruin because of this? There could be a thousand other factors going on. Is there a good support network? These are all things that you have really no insight to. But we tend to think, oh, I've been through it, so I understand it. So, years ago, I took care, well, it wasn't that long ago, I took care of a young lady. And Tragically, she came in the emergency department in hemorrhagic shock. And she didn't look familiar to me. She's about my age. And we worked on her, and she died. It was horrible. So I had to go back in, and, and she had a boyfriend there only, and I had to go back in and tell them that um, she was dead. And obviously, he was real distraught. And then he told me her name, and I realized, oh, my God, I knew her. Not only did I know her, I mean, I had a crush on her. When I was in high school, I used to sit there and just stare at her across you know, the room in history class. Never talked to her. Scared as hell of girls back then. But this is the girl that I just got done, young woman I just got done, coding, and including splitting her chest open, pumping blood into her. And now I was telling the family that she was dead. What was worse is that 
Her father was very well known in the community. And he, we couldn't tell him over the phone, and the, and the friends would not tell him, and they left. So he had to come, and I had to do this all over again. So I went to the room, introduced myself. I knew him. He knew who I, who I was immediately. And I told him, you know, I'm sorry, she's died. Obviously, he was real distraught. A little later, took him back to see her body. Just another, you know, I've done this hundreds of times. People say, um, what's the worst thing you've ever seen in the emergency department? Well, it's not what you've seen, it's what you have to do. The worst thing is telling a spouse, or telling a, a parent that their kid has been killed. That is the worst thing. It's the stuff that will take forever. So, about a week later, I get up, I used to play in this early morning basketball league, and I get up, and I go and play basketball, I come back, you always grab the newspaper, uh, grab a cup of coffee, open the paper, and there on the front page, he had killed himself. Now, do you think I had any idea when I was a pre-med student what it was going to be like one day to run a cardiac arrest on somebody that I knew and had a crush on? What it was like to go in and tell her father that he had died? What it was like to open the paper and realize that he had shot himself? And then wonder if one of the last things that went through his mind before that bullet was me saying, I'm sorry, but she's died. These are the experiences that you're going to take with you and experience one day. And these are the things that are going to change you. Compassion and sympathy and empathy you know, they are key words that we toss around almost with a mystic quality. And that somehow, if we're lacking in it, that maybe we're not as good at doctors, as good at healthcare providers as we think. But let me ask you something. What word would you use to describe a doctor who's had three hours of sleep in two days, his kid has kept him up all night with a crew, his car needs $2,000 in damages, his wife wants to leave him, being sued for malpractice, being bogged down in medical bureaucracy, electronic medical records, he's at the end of his friggin' rope and he could care less right now that Mrs. Smith's husband is dying of cancer, yet he sits there in his office in rapt attention, nodding his head, faking like he's listening, all right, making her feel comfortable even though all he wants is for her to shut up and he wants to go out and pee and have a beer and that's all he's thinking about, but still, he sits and he nods. And this goes on for a half an hour. And finally, Mrs. Smith stands up. She thanks him. She hugs him. Gets weepy. Goes home. Comes with her husband and says, You have the most compassionate and caring doctor in the world. What adjective would you use to describe that doctor? Me? Not me. I describe him as heroic. Okay? Let me tell you something. Heroism trumps compassion every day of the week. In that moment, for that doctor, what he's developed, it, he has learned that it's not about him. His problems, his issues, whatever he's got going on in his life, whether he cares or not, it's not about him. It's about the patient. It's about the patient and the family feeling good. He doesn't have to internalize it. He doesn't have to feel compassion and sympathy. He just has to be responsible, and you just have to do the right thing. And for lack of better, maybe a better term, let's call that pseudo-compassion. And as you go on, you're going to realize this may be the, the most rewarding and selfless thing that you'll ever experience. The ability to do something and to do the right thing and to care for people when you are at the end of your rope and you just don't care. That is what makes doctors heroic. And it's interesting about charity, and we've, I think we've sort of, we're, we're getting into this mindset when it comes to charity and benevolence that, that we have to, we almost think that if we don't feel it, if we're not emotionally invested in it, then we're not as benevolent, we're not as charitable. People have a tendency to think that, and we're almost made to feel guilty. When really, the only reason maybe at, at any given point is you just want that person to F off your doorstep. So you're sitting at home, and you got your feet propped up, and you finally had an opportunity to, to, to watch an IU game. And you've been that doctor with the kid with croup, and up for three days, and 
you just want to rest and next thing you know your dog's barking and you'll see some guy walking up the steps and you know what it's about somebody collecting money for something and you just want to be left alone because you know you're charitable you give 30 percent of your patients never pay a dime and some of the most charitable people in the world but this person comes up to the doorstep and you open the door and you go what here's 20 bucks Leave me alone. The guy's trying to tell you about the food bank that he's collecting money for and that they can feed people for $2 a meal. So you give them $20 and go, go, go. Slam the door and you grab your beer and you prop yourself back up. So the guy throws a 501c3 form on your doorstep so you can deduct your 20 bucks and he goes next door. Knocks on the door. Guy opens the door and he gives him the whole shtick about the food bank. And the guy is rapt attention. He's going through the pamphlet. He's feeling awful and telling you what an incredible job you're doing collecting for the for the, the needy and the hungry. And he gives you ten dollars. One guy who could care less gave you twenty. The other guy who's real sympathetic and empathetic to the cause gives you ten dollars. Which one's more charitable? You have to feel that way in order to be charitable? Let me tell you, you honestly think the person on the other end of that fork gives a rat's ass what your motivation was for giving 20 bucks or 10 bucks? No. You know why? It's not about you. So in Judaism, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting thing called the Hebra Kedisha. It means the Holy Society. These are a group of men and women that are tasked with the responsibility of was called tahara, which is purifying and washing the body for burial. Now, they, they clean them, and I mean they clean everything, every crevice, everything. And they do a bunch of prayers, and they wrap them in muslin, and they you know, prepare them for burial. And it's considered the greatest good deed in mitzvah in Judaism. Well, why do you think that is? Dead people can't thank you. It is 100 absolute selflessness one of the most charitable things to do in the entire world. You can't teach compassion any more than you can teach love, but you can teach medical students and young doctors some key sort of skill sets, maybe, exercises, in order for you to develop at least the appearance of being compassionate and sympathetic. And most of the time, you're going to hover in this world of pseudo-compassion. You're going to have real feelings of compassion and sympathy at times. And you know what? They're going to hurt. But the most of the times, you're going to be hovering in this world of pseudo-compassion. And you're going to forget things. You're going to forget horrible things. But that's all right. It's meant to protect you. But I guess, guess what? It's also going to pop to the surface. It's going to pop to the surface at times where you least expect it. Maybe you're watching your kid play baseball, or you're cutting the lawn, and all of a sudden, an image of something that you took care of will pop in your mind, and you'll say to yourself, how in the hell did I forget that? You'll, also, you'll actually feel a little guilty, like somehow you're lacking in sympathy or empathy because you don't have the dead child at the forefront of your memory all your life. You shouldn't. It protects you. You're going to develop skill sets on your own. You're going to maybe learn that if you sit down when talking to a patient, you'll appear less, ru less rushed and more sympathetic. You may pat them on the hand. You may call them by their first name. Or you may insult somebody by calling them by their first name. You're going to learn that as you go on. You're going to get a better idea about cultural differences, about how people react in certain cultural situations. Hopefully, you'll also learn about this politically correct notion that we have to treat everyone the same. You ever hear that? How to treat them the same. What a bunch of crap. Okay? We treat everybody uniquely. Everybody's different. How do you treat everybody the same? You have to develop a skill set to learn what each patient needs as an individual. That is what's going to make you a, um, a good clinician. You throw a blanket over everybody. You're going to make a lot of people mad. And it's not going to be very rewarding to you either as physicians. You're going to want to learn about your patients. You're going to want to learn about what bothers them. You're going to, in time, learn which hearts you can get started, both realistically and metaphorically, I guess. You're going to learn which battles you fight, which ones you ignore, 
You're going to learn which complaints you need to take to heart in which you just dust under the doormat. You're going to learn how to tell people to go to hell without saying it. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to learn how to tell the truth and lie at the same time. Doctor, am I going to die? Yes, just not today. Way too much paperwork. My wife's making turkey burgers. I have to get home. You're going to learn how to be brutally honest at, at times. Sometimes it's one of the most important skill sets to learn. Um, a couple years ago, um, you guys know what INSPECT is? INSPECT, the narcotic database where you tell if people are using it too much. I take care of a guy that comes in and he goes, uh, clearly seeking drugs. And I'm busy as hell, I'm at the end of my rope, I just want him gone, okay? And I'm trying to explain, listen, you know, he's got a lot of pain medicine, we probably shouldn't be putting you on this, and he's giving me excuse after excuse about why I'm wrong. And I'm about to pull what's left of my hair out, okay? And he says to me, Doc, you're not being straight with me. You've got to be honest with me. I said, I am being honest with you. I've told you everything I can. He goes, no, no, no. You need to talk to me like I'm your brother. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you want me to talk to you like I'm your brother. And he goes, yeah, Doc, get me, get me straight. Tell, talk to me like I'm your brother. And I tell him, all right. Listen, you. <laughs> you know and I know you're addicted to pain medicines. You're breaking mom's heart. You're breaking grandma's heart. That you're a step away from using heroin. You're going to end up killing yourself. And when that happens, you're going to destroy mom. And I'm going to dig up your corpse, and I'm going to beat the living hell out of it. That's what I'd say to you if you're my brother. I said, how about if I call social services, we get you off the drug? Well, okay. Born not out of sympathy, born not out of compassion, born out of being out of the bottom at the end of my road. Another time I take care of a guy, alcoholic, comes in. I can't remember why exactly he came in, but... The big issue was that he was an alcoholic. And I offered to, to get him some help, and he got sort of obstinate. Um, again, I think he wanted pain medicines, wanted out of, out of here. And I finally just looked at him and I said, got any kids? And he gets sort of misty, which yeah, I do, I love my life. I said, well, if we don't get you help, somebody else can be taking your kid to the ballpark. Somebody else can be watching your kid graduate. Somebody else can be watching your child walk down the aisle and getting married. And you will be relegated to being a couple slides on a wedding montage video. So why don't we get you some help? Starts crying, gets all weepy, gets social services involved. Two of the most rewarding patients I've ever had, patient encounters I've ever had, neither one of them born out of compassion and sympathy, just out of being at the end of my rope. You have to be open to that. So compassion, sympathy, and, and empathy. We start to realize that this isn't just a Norman Rockwell kind of painting of you know, a nurse cradling a, a, a sick person or a doctor with a stethoscope or setting a broken arm. It's co something completely different than that. Now, it's also almost impossible to learn compassion and sympathy if you don't know love. Okay. In fact, they sort of say teaching compassion and sympathy is, is like uh, trying to thread an elephant right through the eye of the needle. Have you ever heard that expression? So, who here loves someone? <laughs> I mean love someone. I don't mean love. I love my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my husband or wife kind of love. I mean the love that transcends space and time. I mean, that love that says, I will go through the fires of hell to take care of you for just 10 seconds and to comfort you that way. How many of you have that kind of love? How many of you have children? For those of you that don't have children, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You think you do, but you don't. And in fact, maybe five, 10 years from now, you're going to come back to me. Maybe you're going to be rotating with me over at St. B's. And you go, you're exactly right. 
It's completely different kind of love. So, one of the attendings here. Do you have a child? You? Yeah. you have kids? How old? 23, 26. 23? What's the name of your 23 year old? Suzanne. Suzanne. Did you love Suzanne when she was born? Yeah. How about when she was three? <laughs> Terrible threes or trusting threes. Did <laughs> you love her then? How about when she was 10? Heading off to grade school and bringing you a plaster hand prints and making the turkeys out of cotton balls. Did you love her then? Yeah. How about when she was 16? <laughs> Those <Yeah>. four <laughs> Did you love her the same as when she was two? Did you love her as much? Of course she did. Did you love her as much when she was 23 as she did when she was two? Yeah. Do you think you love her as much when she's 30? How about when she's 50? How about when she's 70? I'm still around. <laughs> How about when she's 90? Do you think for one minute that you're not going to love her as much when she's 90 as when she was two? Do you think any of your folks aren't going to love you as much when you're 90 as when you're 2? And do you think every single one of those parents and you will rage at God for one more chance to come down and comfort your child when she's 90? Just for a chance to hold them again and to take care of them, especially when nobody else is. When they are lying there in a diaper and they're contracted and they're sick and their mouths are open and people are joking about the way they smell or the fact that they're not responding. You don't think for one second you as a parent are going to be looking down and saying to God, please just let me go down there for five minutes. That's the type of love that I'm talking about. And in time, you're going to develop that. And then what's going to happen? Strange thing. You're going to start looking at your patients differently. You're not going to see an old person. You're going to see your kid. And that is how compassion and sympathy develop. It is a lifelong journey. It's going to ebb and flow. It's going to change based on your mental well-being at the time. It's going to have peaks and valleys. It's going to surface to make a child, a little kid giggle, or for you to learn uh, the war stories of a vet. It's this incredible choreographed dance. It's just a reflection of life. It's a reflection of your progress. Choreograph dance. It's just a reflection of life. It's a reflection of your progress as being a doctor. It's magical. It's mystical. It's what creates, makes medicine the greatest career in the world. In time, you're going to get better at it. And I can't wait to see what happens to all of you down the line. Thank you. Thank you.